Cool, so uh, let's kick off. So thank you very much for coming. My name is Duncan Wynn. So this talk is titled Simple Abstractions for the Challenge of Complexity, or how Cloud Foundry's layered approach allows for isolated components and a pattern of reuse. So that's a huge mouthful. And if you've come to this talk just on that title, thank you very much. You've made it this far. So to unpack that, I'm going to take you on my personal journey with Cloud Foundry. So I've been involved with Cloud Foundry for a number of years, and I help companies install and configure and help companies get started with Cloud Foundry. I'm a consultant for Pivotal. I've worked both here in EMEA, and I currently work in the US. And throughout these engagements, especially with this getting started experience, I typically find I come across the same set of pr problems and challenges again and again. So I sat down, I started to write a book for O'Reilly just to capture the technical concerns and the technical considerations around installing and configuring Cloud Foundry. And I've got some early releases here at the end if anyone's interested. This is kind of half the book, although it's almost finished. Some way into that journey of writing about Cloud, Fernie, about Cloud Foundry at the 2014 CF Summit, I was introduced to this guy, Onzi. And Onzi took the Cloud Foundry community through some of the changes with the Elastic Runtime and some of the challenges with the old Elastic Runtime and how Diego fixed a number of these problems. Now this presentation is still on YouTube, it's a really, really good presentation. So if anyone hasn't seen it, I'd strongly recommend that you go and have a look. But just to summarize what Onzi talked about, he talked about the tight coupling of the components and some of the orchestration challenges that the cloud controller had because the cloud controller had too much responsibility and it had too much control over what was going on. He also talked about these triangular dependencies and this poor separation of concerns between some of the components. And this led to a real challenge. I'm just going to switch. Does this work still? Wow, cool. So he talked about this poor separation of concerns. And this led to a challenge that Cloud Foundry was hard to reason over and hard to test and also hard to manage the existing features. But more importantly, at the time, it was hard to add new features. And this was a real problem, because back in 2014, Cloud Foundry was just about the app. It only supported one type of workload. And it was very platform specific, meaning it had Linux specific code hardwired throughout. And so Diego was pitched as this ground up rewrite of the Elastic Runtime in Go. And September, um, September last year, in 2015, the first GA version of Diego was released. This was the first version that supported zero downtime deploys. Now, Diego is fantastic for the Cloud Foundry community, but as an author trying to write about Cloud Foundry, this was really problematic. It meant I had to go away and refactor 50 pages very quickly. And then if that wasn't bad enough, Dimitri came out with Bosch 2.0 earlier this year, and it meant I had to refactor another three chapters. So writing about stuff is hard, but when the technology is changing as fast as Cloud Foundry, it becomes even more problematic. And as I was delving into the weeds of Cloud Foundry and really understanding the detail, I stepped back and asked myself this question, you know, why should I care? Not about Cloud Foundry. I think Cloud Foundry is fantastic. But the detail of Cloud Foundry, the detail of how Diego works, why should I care? And at the back of my mind, I had the developer. And thinking, as a developer, why should you care about this stuff? Why should you care about Cloud Foundry internals and its abstractions and how it works? Again, borrowing from Onzi, we have this fantastic developer mantra. Here is my app. Run it on the cloud for me. I don't care how. And by the developer, I'm not just talking about the person who cuts code. I'm talking about the entire team responsible for developing and running that application. They, by and large, think of Cloud Foundry as this black box. They push their application, Cloud Foundry does its thing, and returns an endpoint, a routable endpoint. So they don't really need to peel back the covers and understand what's going on. And for anyone who's been working with Cloud Foundry for some time, this is the highest level of abstraction that we're used to, that developers think about their work. They think about their apps, their tasks, their services. They don't really need to be mindful of what container orchestration you're using or what version of Linux you're running on. All of those are the platform concerns, and that undifferentiated heavy lifting is really what the platform is there to take care of for you. So it got me thinking back to this book. The book isn't really for developers. Cloud Foundry is so easy to use as a developer that if you were going to capture those developer concerns, a book like that would be really small. And so in true agile fashion, 
I decided to actually start small and I wrote such a book. So I've got some of these around as well if anyone's interested. This isn't really targeting the developer, but this is the developer experience of delivering agile software with velocity. So in my naivety, I thought that small book would be about a week, but six months later, I was back to the original book and I was able to frame my question much better. As an operator, why should I care about Cloud Foundry's abstractions? And this is a really important question to ask, not just for an author trying to understand his audience, but for the Cloud Foundry community as a whole, why should you care about Diego and the internals? And to answer this, you need to understand the, concept, the context of another question, and that's why a distributed system so hard in the first place. So to level set, in case anyone's completely new to this stuff, distributed systems involve a number of components and they're networked or they're connected together. And because there's many moving parts, they become inherently complex because you need to orchestrate them. Halfway through Onzi's original talk, he had this comment, it was almost like an off the cuff throwaway comment, but it really resonated with me, that within a distributed system, it's hard to have an accurate picture of the world at all times. And when you look at Cloud Foundry, it's a multi-user, multi-component environment. It has a number of microservices. Things can fail. Usage paths change. Auto-scaling can kick in. Self-healing can kick in. All of these things can change state, and they need to be tracked and potentially responded to. Moreover, there are just inherent challenges with any distributed system. So for example, Heterogeneity, the ability to, to support multiple different environments. Cloud Foundry manages this really well. It has a Bosch CPI for supporting different IS layers like AWS or vSphere or Azure. We have build packs to support that polyglot programming environment. So you can support Ruby, you can support Java or all the languages that run on the JVM and you can support Node and so on. And it also has this marketplace for the middleware services like Redis and RabbitMQ and MySQL. But all those components need to be extensible. You need to be able to extend the platform. And again, a great example of this is the route service or route service. Instead of the marketplace just being about the middleware components, you now have services for the route to your application. And again, new CPIs are coming out all the time with Photon and GCP. And also you can extend the build packs and you have other build packs like the Tommy E build pack coming out. So extensibility is really key. You also need transparency. Now, a lot of people look at transparency as everything being open and available, but actually in a distributed system, I feel it actually really means the opposite. Instead of seeing all the complexity and all the gory details, what distributed systems need to do is they hide that level of complexity and make them transparent to the end user, make it clear to the end user. So the end user has a really simple way of interacting with that system. Distributed systems also need stable APIs. They need well-defined APIs that are stable. An example of a good stable API is, or effectively like a USB, it's been around for ages. A bad API would be like the new iPhone um, headphone jack. And um, yeah, I mean, it means you have to update your earphones and everything else. So you need those. APIs to be stable as much as possible. This gives each component the ability to be independent and decoupled. And that's really valuable because then you can plug and play those components. You can swap them out, replace them, and the system as a whole carries on working. So just to delve into the details for Cloud Foundry for a second, a great example of stable APIs is the cell. So if you look at a Linux cell, applications run on cells in Linux, they run on RunC-backed containers. Containers are managed by Garden, and the cell itself is managed by the rep, and the rep talks to Diego. Now, there's a decoupled um, interaction between Garden and the rep, but there's a strong contract between them. Because Garden isn't participating as part of that wider distributed system, you can make breaking changes to the API. But because it's coupled to the rep, you'll also have to change the rep. By keeping the Garden API stable, it's got really strong advantages. So for example, you can swap out the back end. It was Guardian, now it's Run C. If there's a CVE, all you have to do is upgrade Garden. And we make a promise to the community that if you're on Diego version X and above, all you need to do is redeploy Garden and you get all the later security fixes. You don't have to do any changes to the rep or any other component. So stable APIs are really valuable. <coughs> 
Distributed systems also need to support concurrency. When you have many different users, whether they're users of your application or whether they're different developers, all competing to view and update the same piece of data, the system needs to handle that in a robust way and things like dynamic routing and distributed locks really help with dealing with the concurrency challenges. So the list of, list of complexity just keeps on growing. There's things like security and self-healing and monitoring and logging and user management. When you're running a distributed system, especially in a cloud environment, there's many components that go into making that system stable and reliable. So in essence, they're hard to build and complex in nature. And it's because distributed systems like Diego are complex, there's a lot of value in really understanding them. For example, the Cloud Foundry operator, there's at least two reasons why they should be concerned about the internals. The first reason you need to care is because you want to debug your app. If the user's accessing an endpoint or route in Cloud Foundry from an application, and for some reason that route goes away, there could be any number of failures to cause that to happen. And without understanding the system, you don't know where to debug. So for example, your container could have died or your app may have crashed in the container. The rep on the cell may have died and it looks like your cell is offline. Or the route emitter may have died, causing the dynamic routing table not to get updated. So any one of these failures could cause that effect. And it's important to understand the flow of communication between the components in the system to really understand what's going on. The second reason why you need to care about the internals is because you need to establish resiliency. Components like Consul and XED and MySQL use a raft protocol, which means they need a quorum. And to have a quorum, you need an odd number. If you just have a single node and that node dies, you've lost your service. If you have two nodes and a single node dies, you still don't have more than 50% remaining. And therefore, the system as a whole will shut down and may need manual intervention to restart. So ideally, you need three nodes, preferably in three different AZs. So if you lose a node or you lose an AZ, your system still has quorum and it still remains operational. Other components like the brain, you have multiple versions for resiliency, but they can only work in isolation, so they need to establish things like distributed locks to ensure that they're not trampling over each other. So again, by understanding the system, it helps you build in the right level of resiliency. So how does Diego deal with some of these distributed system challenges? The more I looked at Diego, the more I realized it actually has a very elegant approach. And I've loosely termed these as Diego abstractions. And I'm going to take you through some of the high level ones. Diego itself is a subsystem to Cloud Foundry. So things like Cloud Foundry's Cloud Controller and Cloud Foundry's Logigator access Diego as a client. Diego is comprised of a number of independent components. And each component hosts a set of microservices which is scoped to the boundary of that component. And as I mentioned, the important thing to understand is how work flows through the system. Actually understanding the technical implementation of things like the BBS and what backs a BBS is less important. The engineers can swap out um, XED for MySQL, for example, and by and large, the system should operate in the same way. So Diego is a decoupled infrastructure. A number of different components are responsible for the orchestration. And it handles this through a separation of concerns between these components. And it uses abstraction layers as workflow throughout the system. And this gives the benefit that work can be agnostic. So Diego can now support a richer set of workloads. And it's also container agnostic, both in the image format you deploy to Cloud Foundry and also on the back end as well in terms of how you run your applications. The first abstraction I want to cover is subsystems. And again, this may seem like I'm going off at a tangent, but actually subsystems are really important to Cloud Foundry. Diego has been encapsulated in its own Bosch release, so its own code base. And this is really valuable because it's become independently deployable as a standalone system. Standalone systems typically offer a pattern of reuse. I don't know anyone outside the Cloud Foundry system using Diego, so why is this so important to have an independent code base? And it gives a couple of things. When you start to decompose, conceptually at least, a monolith into subsystems, it allows each individual sub subsystem to grow and evolve as it needs to. This increases the developer velocity, but it also has a really rich side benefit of testability. 
So the release engineer or the platform operator can take a more granular approach to testing because they have a number of different subsystems. So for example, if you deploy the latest version of Diego, but you back it with an old version of Postgres, if you then migrate that version of Postgres to a new version, will Diego still be able to interact with it? So in addition to just having backwards compatible APIs, you can also now to have a more granular approach to actually migrating disparate components. So it gives a richer testing cycle. But in addition, for the individual teams, it allows for isolated testing. So now just the owner of that subsystem can focus on their subsystem. They can have assurance that the teams which they depend on have done their due diligence. And they can also not worry too much about the downstream teams. It means that their view of the distributed system is way smaller, which then ultimately allows them to move a lot faster. The second abstraction is workload abstraction. So most people know that Cloud Foundry has moved beyond just supporting applications to this more generic term of long-running processes and tasks. So a long-running process is Diego's view of your application. It's desired to just keep on running. Diego has a view conceptually of a desired LRP, a long-running process, and an actual process running in a container known as your actual LRP. If you scale that process, you can then have multiple actual LRPs for your LRP. Now, LRPs have a life cycle. I'm not going to dig too much into Diego's state machine. But these life cycles pretty much map to the behavior you would expect. So if you see your application running, it's likely to be in running state. If you see it crashed, it's likely to be in the crash phase of the life cycle. But the reason why life cycles are important to understand is if you go in and query Diego's um, database of BBS, and you see your applications in unclaimed state, it could well be you haven't provisioned enough resource for yourselves. So by understanding something about the lifecycle state, it can help you troubleshoot as well. So on to tasks. Tasks are guaranteed to be run at once. They're effectively a singleton. They should always terminate, and they should have a finite running time. So tasks could be anything from a one-off script, like a batch job or a con job, or maybe you're doing stream processing using ELT. Applications themselves can call out and run one-off tasks, so applications can now use this task abstraction. But the other important feature of the task abstraction is that Cloud Foundry itself uses tasks. As an end user, you ask Cloud Foundry to run your application, your application goes through the staging process, and the staging request from Diego gets encapsulated as an internal task from Diego. So in addition to tasks and LRPs, Applications or actual LRTs also have this app lifecycle. The app lifecycle is responsible for building and running and keeping your app running. So there's three distinct phases. There's the builder, which actually runs your application. Or sorry, that builds your droplet and builds your application. There's a the launcher, which runs your application. There's also a health check that runs alongside the application in the container. Application lifecycles aren't anything new. They've been around for some time. So in the old world, they were packaged as build packs on the runner, the DEA, the VM that used to be responsible for running the, component of the applications. And you can start to get a sense of this tight coupling between what actually ran. Oh, sorry, I just go back one. Between what ran, how it worked, and also where it ran. So this tight coupling was um, one of the core challenges originally. Build packs still exist, but they're part of this more generic execution. So now they're not coupled with the cell, meaning the cell is significantly lighter weight. And also, because they're decoupled, you have this pluggability. You can have build pack life cycles, Docker life cycles, window life cycles. If you have a different type of workload in the future, um, you can just add that in the mix. So the way it works is when you need to use something like a build pack, it gets injected into the cell. So it's decoupled and it's, de and it's pluggable. So looking at containers, and I've touched on this before in a previous talk, but I still see a lot of confusion out there in terms of what actually can Cloud Foundry support. In terms of the file system, Cloud Foundry supports Docker images, and it also supports the ability for you to push your application and allow Cloud Foundry to build it into a droplet plus a stack. So the file system is what you actually run. The thing responsible for building and running that isolated process, that container management, is Garden, and Garden can be backed by Linux or it can be backed currently by Windows. But really, we talk about containers. Anything which adheres to the Garden API can be plugged in. So if you want to run on RunV or you want to run on bare metal, conceptually, all of that can be plugged into that Garden API.
So Diego itself has what we loosely term action abstraction. And this is fairly complicated, but all the pieces within Diego are totally independent, decoupled concerns. And that means that they can solve their task at hand in isolation. They can choose to have unique expressions of the problem as it flows through the Diego system. And it can choose the right expression depending on the problem being solved. Now, there's a lot of information there, so let's visualize that. As you CF push as an end user your app to the cloud controller, the cloud controller then passes it into this bridge layer called the CC bridge. That then goes to Diego's database, it goes on to an auction, and ultimately that request ends up as a scheduled process running on a container. As work flows through the system, it starts really coarse-grained as this big kind of boulder-like analogy. And it gets broken down into finally something very granular as a scheduled process. Now, if everything within Diego was concerned with this schedule process, it would be incredibly brittle and it would be very complicated for the end user to interact with it. So by adopting the ability for each component to have its own view of the work and its own expressions of that work and abstractions, it allows for this plug and play model where you can take things out and replace them, but it also allows for this really easy, transparent client, client interaction. And so as this workload gets kicked off, as the cloud controller interacts with Diego, it's imperative it can say, run this, and then it can leave Diego to do its thing. Diego knows about the desired state, and it tries to rectify the desired state with the actual state and run that workload. So the cloud controller, beyond that point, doesn't need to be overly concerned with how Diego does its job. So the cloud controller, which is Cloud Foundry, and Diego have two effectively different views of the world. Diego's view is very generic, and Cloud Foundry's view is very specific for Cloud Foundry. And this bridge component in the middle allows the translation between the two. So for example, when you stage your application, uh, Cloud Foundry knows that the app needs to be staged, but Diego turns that into a generic set of staging tasks, or LRPs, and so on. And the uploader as well, Cloud Foundry knows that you should upload droplets to its blob store and download droplets from its blob store. But the upload action in Diego is only concerned about upload a file to this URL. It doesn't have to specify the URL as the blob store. That's Cloud Foundry's concern to tell Diego about it. So the BBS, Diego's BBS, which is effectively Diego's API, uses something called composable actions. And this is the next layer down from tasks and LRPs. So we talked about tasks and LRPs. They get translated into Diego's composable actions, things like download a droplet, download action, run action. And again, these are imperative actions. They're an instruction set, and you get this tree, and these instructions end up being the components that actually run on the cell, in the, sorry, in the container. So how do LRPs um, and tasks translate to these composable actions? So let's take a Take um, the scenario where you're staging an app, or you're running a staged app. You will have three composable actions. You have a download action to download the droplet from the CC blob store. There's another download action to download the app lifecycle binaries. And then there's a run action to run all this stuff onto a container. The important thing is this is another level of granularity beyond the LRPs, but this is still describing the desired activity, not the implementation. So as I mentioned, things like the implementation that you're downloading from the blob store, all of that still comes from the cloud controller. So the last abstraction I'm going to talk about is closed feedback loops. And again, this is key to keeping that distributed system in place. So the CC bridge has two core components to offer this closed feedback loop. It's the ability to handle domain freshness. And this is done by NSYNC, and it's also done by the TPS. So the cloud controller tells the CC bridge, doesn't speak to Diego directly, it tells the CC bridge about the desired app. And then NSYNC tells Diego to go and make that so. So Diego has this view of the world that it knows what the cloud controller wants, it knows the desired state, and it goes through its auction process to make that a reality. So at that point, everything's good, and Diego is running the required level of apps. If an app crashes, because Diego knows the desired state, it can bring another instance of that app back. But just stopping there isn't enough, because this is a distributed system, it's eventually consistent, and cloud controller's view of the world may change. 
Maybe it wants something different, or maybe it sent so many messages to Diego that one of those messages has been lost. So there's this NSYNC bulker that periodically checks cloud controllers required state, its desired state, and what's actually running over in Diego. And then using cloud controller as the authority, the NSYNC bulker, th bulker can then give Diego a new view of the world, a new desired state. There's also this TPS listener and watcher as well, and this gives the cloud controller the ability to query Diego and find out what's going on. And it also listens for any crash events and it feeds this back into the cloud controller as well. So this closed feedback loop is essential for um, getting that domain freshness in place. And we see this model again and again. So the brain to the rep interaction works in a similar way where the auction passes information over and then the conferger is looking for that state to rectify if anything's missing. So again, that's a whistle-stop tour through the abstractions. We've talked about subsystems, we've talked about workloads and life cycles, container abstractions, composable actions and feedback loops. So these are Diego's abstractions for dealing with that challenge of complexity. And Diego has a layered approach and the layered approach allows for each component to work in isolation and it also affords this pattern of reuse. Ultimately, that gives you better user transparency. And with each subsystem, whether it's the Diego subsystem with respect to Cloud Foundry, or it's the subsystems within Diego, you get this iterative development, this development velocity, and better testability. And you also get this plug and play capability as well. So that's it. Thank you very much.